transport, uh, however we finance it at the end of the day, is how a kid gets to school. Um, increasingly, it's about how a kid gets to school safely. A quarter of a million kids get killed on the roads every day just walking to school, every year walking to school. It's about how you get to healthcare. It's about how you move um, stuff around. It's about how you get food to market. It's about trade. It's about the competitiveness of countries, the competitiveness of regions within countries. So it's, I mean, it, it's been the bed, bread and butter of the World Bank Group for more than 60 years, but it's, it's really the lifeblood of economies uh, going forward. Um, and so the, f you know, not only funding it in general, but then working out what you fund first or what the strategic approach to transport is, really increasingly we see is defining the way in which uh, a country can sort of navigate its growth. Um, I think there's some important trends going forward which we haven't um, necessarily all experienced in the past. And urbanization, I think, is one of the biggest ones. Um, over the next 20 years, we're going to put another 2 billion people in cities. Um, a lot of those people are going to be poor. Cities are the poles of competitiveness within a country. It's where a lot of the uh, growth comes from. And so um, the transport infrastructure is what defines, it's, it's, it's the skeleton of a city. It's what defines how that city will grow. And so planning the transport infrastructure that will move people around um, in a safe and healthy way is going to be fundamental. So by that I mean this has to be low carbon transport. 80% uh, of global carbon emissions come from cities. 75% of the people are going to live there. We're going to have to grapple with this at the city level. Um, you don't have to make the global public good of carbon reduction the main point. Uh, if we do it in a low carbon way, it means the kids that go to school on the bus, the kids that uh, grow up and go to work on the bus rapid transit will be able to breathe and they'll be healthy and they will grow and they won't be stunted. So there's an immediate private health good uh, to uh, good transport planning. Um, so I, I think that there is a, a conundrum about how we, uh, how we do that for the cities of today and the future. That's, that's it's spend um, in transport in cities that already exist, which is extremely expensive in refitting. But we're going to be building a lot more cities in the future, and those cities are going to grow very rapidly, and getting their urban skeleton is absolutely, I think, fundamental. Maybe I should leave it there. Um, thank you very much, Rachel. Can I, can I ask you... What, um, what proportion of GDP should countries ideally be spending on their transport? And if you're able to answer that question, what kind of a funding gap does that suggest that we are looking at at the moment, for, particularly for developing countries? Well, the rule of thumb is uh, countries should spend between 3 and 4% of GDP on transport infrastructure. Um, as an international community, we're running behind in general. I mean, most countries are spending... One, one and a half, two, if, you, if you're lucky. Uh, of course, China um, has outstripped most countries by investing four or five in, in recent years. Um, and so uh, when you look at, um, I mean, so growth has been slowing down globally, but, you know, we've got countries running uh, GDP growth at six, seven percent. Um, so you, the, the actual investment in, in transport has to be quite substantial. Now, um, what's the gap in funding? Uh, the gap is calculated in, just in transport infrastructure over the next 10 years at about three to four uh, trillion dollars. Um, I think that's slightly uh, more expensive when you consider that it has to be resilient transport systems because we're going to experience more and more natural disasters. Um, you're going to have sea level rise, you're going to have cities flooding and things like that. So you have to factor in the cost of resilience. Um, but, you know, the gap is quite substantial. I mean, the multilateral development banks last year pledged to spend $175 billion of our own capital on transport over the next decade, and that was a big announcement. So you can see the gap between us and where, the, where, where we need to be, and where, why our money, I think, is important, that's all of us, not just the World Bank, is because that's the public money that can be leveraged to, to crowd in private financing. That's the concessional money that can help uh, buy down the risk, as we talked about as ministers this morning. So it's a big gap. So three to four trillion over 10 years, so that's the same as saying, is it three to four hundred billion dollars, too little being spent each year, yeah. in your view? Absolutely. Okay. We've been talking this afternoon about how we allocate budgets within a transportation budget. But of course, there's a separate debate, which is you know, how you get the transportation budget in the first place, 
vis-à-vis -vis all the things that the transportation budget needs to compete with. So I thought I might ask Rachel, uh, you have identified this enormous funding gap for transportation. But as the World Bank, you know that there are lots of other things that need to be done to help people out of poverty as well, like, I don't know, clean water or anti-malarial uh, drug campaigns or uh, access to justice, transparent systems of finance, um, the, the, the ability to obtain loans, all these sorts of things. So how on earth in an organization like the World Bank do you prioritize where transportation should be vis-a-vis -vis these other programs? Uh, well, you know, setting priorities in an institution like ours is a sort of iterative process between what the client wants, what we um, think and have learned over the years works, and then, you know, hopefully there's a bottom-up, top-down process and it meets in the middle and the client's happy and our shareholders are happy. Um, what I, what I think, is, what I think is, is clear is that, you know, the data and the impact evaluation and sort of the outcome data over the years shows that the investment in infrastructure then is foundational for meeting your food security needs, meeting your energy security needs. So, I mean, it, it's difficult to imagine a functioning economy, especially in, in a global economy, without, without, without that infrastructure. And so it is very much front of mind for ministers of finance and planning. I think the question is buying, this, buying yourself the political space, the economic planning space, and the fiscal space to be able to invest over the long run. Um, and the points that Doris was making for, for, for what developed countries face, I mean, you know, it just gets even more complicated for the developing countries. We've talked a lot about crowding the private sector and immobilizing private, private finance. Uh, about 10% of sort of global infrastructure spend came from the private sector uh, in recent years. But that's extraordinarily focused on certain middle-income countries. And, and that's become even more pronounced after the financial crisis in 2008. Um, and so, you know, if you're a low-income country, um, perhaps without, you know, good uh, PPP laws, without... Um, you know, a certain deficit in governance. Uh, you probably don't have uh, transparency necessarily in purchasing decisions and procurement laws might not be very... I mean, you, you, you just, this, is, this becomes a very big long-term sort of hand-holding strategy for us and others like us. Um, so I think, it's, uh, I think it's quite complicated. Of the 68 PPPs um, that, were, that reached financial conclusion in, 2000, in 2011, three in transport, three were in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so um, I think we were talking at lunch, you know, we can all tell you, you know, the great PPPs that happened last year. At some point that has to go beyond anecdote. We, we're going to have to be at the point where we can't remember because there were so many. Uh, so they remain complicated, complex risk management processes.